Hello everybody, welcome to the 27th uh, Derek Arden's chat show. Uh, at least we've got 27 on YouTube. We've had one or two others, but uh, we certainly couldn't uh, put those ones on YouTube for whatever reason. You might notice that uh, I've dressed up today. Uh, someone's just coming in late. I've dressed up today particularly because we were talking about branding. We were talking about how you come across. And one of the things I learned at a very early stage both in my banking and my speaking career, is people will judge you in the first few seconds. And therefore, if they're gonna judge you in the first few seconds, then they better be judging you who's somebody who's expensive, expensive to hire. If they're gonna take you on in their business, they're gonna to wanna to employ you. And the second thing I learned was a white shirt is particularly powerful. I noticed that most Americans wear white shirts and white shirts are particularly powerful. And I had some coaching on that as well. And the other thing is if you're speaking at a conference uh, and you get a bit hot, if you've got a white shirt, it doesn't notice. Whereas if you've got a blue shirt, sometimes the politicians can look like they're under pressure and they're a bit uh, sweaty. Ties are a uh, interesting issue these days. Should you be with, it, with a tie or without a tie? I think it depends on the circumstances. But my first tip is you can always dress down, but you can never dress up. So if you went for an interview with someone or there was someone you're going to try and persuade, influence, build rapport with, do that mirroring and matching that we know is so important, they've got a tie on and you haven't, you're thrown. And the same with the ladies, whether they wear a suit, whether they wear a, a dress, how you come across exactly the same thing. If it's power, you can always dress down from power dressing, but you certainly can't dress up if you've called it wrong. So uh, it's my first tip something to think about. And before I let uh, Will loose, I'm firing a few questions at me. I wanted to talk uh, about my success tips for, uh, for this week, for this month. And it comes out of all our communications over the last uh, nine weeks. Don't forget to take this time to review what you do, recharge your batteries, and then reset your plans from how you're gonna do it because the new normal is gonna be very, very, very much different. From, uh, from what's happening. And uh, my second tip is there's two sides to everything. And we've been talking about this again, all through the program. Put yourself in the other person's shoes. Where are they coming from? Because you may think that your view is right, but you're probably not, uh, not uh, right. And in fact, I think it was Jack Welch who said, there's actually three sides to everything. Mine, yours, and the correct one. So um, us, uh, People who want to think about things carefully need to put ourselves in the other's shoes. So I'm delighted at this point to change the interviewing technique. And uh, my friend Will Kintish, who you all know, the networking guru in the UK, is now going to fire a few questions at me, Will. Are you there, Will? Are you unmuted, Will? Thank you, Derek. Derek and I met about 20 blur years ago. We both uh, met at the BBCTA, British Business Consultants and Trainers Association, where we met a guy called Peter Thompson. Now, I've just heard that Peter is going to be on uh, Derek's chat show in the next week or so. Uh, do you know exactly when, Derek? Uh, the 10th. The 10th. 10th of June. Lunchtime. I've got to tell you guys, if you're in that world, I can't recommend him highly enough. And in a few minutes, I'm going to be asking one of the questions to Derek about who was one of your great influencers. Well, for me, it's Peter Thompson. So I'm doing a plug for Peter. And I think you'll agree with me, Derek, that he's a man worth listening to. Yeah, I've got a story about how I met Peter, how I followed up on Peter after that as well. And it's something that everyone can learn from. But I'll, uh, I'll, okay. I'll come to that so, later. Yeah. Let's start at the very beginning, as the song goes. Where were you born and where did you spend most of your life? Okay, I was born in Kensal Rise in northwest London. For those of you that know that part of London, it was a rough area. Uh, it had been quite bomb damaged in the war and the UK didn't have much money to put it right. So there were a lot of prefabricated houses that uh, people were living in. And uh, I was uh, brought up there. We lived in uh, a, a house and then we had to move into a council house. Uh, my mum and dad had no money whatsoever, and uh, that's, uh, that's where I was brought up for the... Uh, uh, in fact, I lived at home for the first 25 years of my life. Well, yeah. So tell us all, what is your um, 
fondest childhood memory? Can you remember? I know you're very old, so this could be a hard question, this one. Well, I'm not as old as you, Will, but we keep our ages secret, don't we? Because uh, age is an attitude, not a number, as I re keep reminding Come on, you. stop bullshitting. What's the answer to the question? <laughs> it's going on holiday with my mum and dad for two weeks holiday. That's all they could afford. That's all the only time that my, uh, my dad got off from the press association who he worked for. He was a horse racing reporter to Margate. To Margate in Kent, we went on holiday. We went to the same boarding house for the say for, for 12 years. And I may have told you this, some of you that know me well, uh, the man that ran it, a guy called John Farrell, who's been a mentor of mine, giving me loads of tips. I flew to Perth, Western Australia, to speak at his 100th birthday party uh, five years ago. Sadly, he's passed on now, but uh, uh, going on the sand, building sand castles, playing cricket, playing football on the beach, watching the tide go in and out. Fondest memories with my mum and dad. Lovely. Fabulous. Fabulous. You can see uh, I'm really in there. I have very similar. When we went to Blackpool, if you lived in Manchester in the 50s and 60s, again, it was 40 miles away, 60 kilometres away, and that's where you went for your holidays. Fabulous. Um, when I met you probably 20 to 25 years ago, I can't remember, were you already, had you left banking or were you still in banking? No, I remember we met, you were leaving accountancy and I was leaving banking. I had negotiated a fabulous deal with uh, the bank I worked for and uh, I was, they were keeping there for three or four months to make sure I handed all the, the accounts over to uh, the person who was taking over from me. But uh, I already had a goal to work for myself, to uh, learn as much as I could and to pass that on to other people. That was my clear goal and we, we were both biting the bullet at the same time. You were, you were about 50, I was about 35 at the time, I remember it clearly. Yes, Derek, yes, Derek, if you say so. Next question, Will. <laughs> um, so what made you go into banking? Oh yeah, well my dad, I wanted to be a cartographer, but my dad, I only had three O-levels or GCSEs. My dad uh, always wanted to be a bank manager, so he marched me down to Barclays in Kensal Rise, made an appointment for me, and uh, said, you're gonna see the bank manager, I fixed it. So best thing he ever did. The bank manager was a hockey player. He played for Barclays and he st I got the job almost on the spot because I played hockey uh, to a high standard. And he said, right, the first day you join the bank, you're training at a bank sports ground at Ealing. And uh, that's what I did. I said, oh, I might be busy that day. He said, you're not busy, you're, you're training. And that day I met some real high achievers who became my mentors. I watched what they did. I was 17, they were 25 maybe, and I learned so much from them. Suddenly I started growing from that point. And so, yeah, I thought I'd stay for three weeks, well, but I stayed for uh, 33 years. You did 33 years, I did 35 years. I had a similar story, Derek. Um, I was 16, I took my GCSEs. Uh, like you, I didn't do very well, I got about five. And the headmaster told me I wasn't clever enough to go to university. He said, go and get a job. I said, what am I going to do, sir? He said, the only thing you're good at is numbers, so you might as well go and be an accountant. <laughs> Unfortunately, my mother had died just as I was taking my exam. My father wasn't a very educated man, so he couldn't give me any advice. So when Mr. Hanforth, the headmaster, said, go and be an accountant, that was it. Yeah. And a bit like you... Uh, my auntie Letty, who drove me to the headmaster, because we didn't have a car, uh, I came out of the headmaster's study and I said, I've been told to go and be an accountant. And her face lit up. She said, oh, you can go and work for your Uncle Jerry. So a bit of nepotism on both our parts here. As we've said all our lives, Derek, it's not what you know, it's who you know. Absolutely. And, and in today's world, it's going to be no different from 30, 40 years ago. Okay, so we, I've talked about Peter Thompson uh, and one or two other people. Just give us one or two people who've really influenced you in your life. Okay, let's talk about the first two people, my mum and my dad, who are sadly no longer here. They brought me up, I was an only child, they brought me up with proper values, uh, with no money, um, and they said to me, be careful who you mix with, because if you get in with the wrong crowd, 
that's what you'll end up with. So they encouraged me to, uh, to meet smart people and to get a job. I think my first job was 12 delivering leaflets. My second job was setting up a little car washing business with my pal. We were knocking on doors around Wilsdon doing car washing for uh, 12 and sixpence uh, each and, um, and, and doing things like that. So I was always hungry for, for things like that. So my mum and dad, and then it was people who I noticed, and we've talked about this before, I noticed who the high achievers were straight away uh, in, in the bank, like I did when we met in the BBCTA and when we met in the uh, Speaking Association. And if you hang around those people, you pick up their energy, you pick up what they've learned, etc. And I've always, uh, always been, um, I've always done that. And I wanted to stick around smart people. So I've met a huge number of people, which I'm hugely proud to meet. And we haven't got time to go through them, but I've been influenced by people like the chief executive of Barclays because I knew, I saw what he did. I saw the resilience and the pressure he was in, under in a particular cer cer set of circumstances when Barclays were going to lose a shed load of money. And he took me into his confidence and all sorts of things like that. So a huge amount of people. When I left Barclays, Peter Thompson in the UK, and what I said to Peter is, can I come up and meet you? And he said, why don't we play golf? And I played golf with him and we had a buggy and uh, I took a notepad and all the way around the golf course, I let him win, of course, so you'll hear me tell that story. Um, I was taking notes the whole time. I wish I'd taken a recording. He was just coming out with gems. And he said to me, never charge less than 2000 pounds for a day's workshop. And this was 20 <laughs> years ago. And I was gonna charge about 500 pounds. And he said, no. And that's what I was saying when, we, when I came on. If you look good, you look smart, and your website and your material is good, then you should be charging a high figure. Now, you know, we don't, I didn't always get 2,000 pounds, but if you set the bar high, you can always come down. So, huge amount of people. And I've got to say, Tim, Kevin, Martin, uh, and lots of people who are on this call of who all influenced me big time. And Keith, who's been doing my website and nagging me on social media for 18 years. So it's what you say, it's not who you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And one of the questions no one's asked me yet is how did I manage to get 30 top class speakers to speak on this program um, as soon as lockdown came? And the answer uh, is- I know, because you asked them. I asked them nicely. And I- All yeah. right, two, let's stop. Two more questions. Okay, go for it. Uh, you started out in banking very young, you were perhaps a clerk, and then maybe you became a relationship manager. This uh, speciality of yours, of helping people to become much better at negotiating, how did that evolve? Oh, that evolved because I, um, I became the uh, corporate banking director for the retail team, and I became the corporate banking director because the previous guy resigned and one of my the guys that worked for me mike roberts rang me up i was on a course and he said dell and they some people call me dell uh, dell he said um george has resigned ring up and ask for the job and i said oh, i'll do that later and he said no ring up now he said alan brown's in his room he's got the authority to uh, promote the person you're the guy for the job uh, ring up before they uh, it, before they uh, employ some some other person who messed the whole thing up. So uh, I rang Alan up. He was totally taken aback that I called him, and uh, I ended up uh, I ended up with a job. That's another one of yours, Will, isn't it? If you don't ask, you don't get. It. Oh no! Let's remember Peter Thompson, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. If you don't ask the question, you don't give the other person an opportunity to say yes. Okay, final question. And ladies and gentlemen, in a minute, I'm going to ask Derek to open it up. You must have one or two questions to ask him. So please be ready to ask him a question. So my final question is, what are you most proud of? Oh, wow. Okay. Okay, that's a, that's a good question. I think I'm most proud of uh, writing a book, Win Win, which was published all over the world by by Pearson. I think the reason I'm most proud of it is because I never in for one moment struggling to get English GCSE thought I would ever be a writer or an author. Uh, I thought I'd be a speaker because I've done lots of training, uh, lots of speaking and I love, love doing that and love making a difference to an audience. But a book and everyone told me I had to write a book and blah 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 and I did. I self-published a book but at the end of the day Pearson came knocking via LinkedIn and asked me 
to uh, write a book for them. And I was not in competition with anyone because of the social media, the work Keith had done for me behind the scenes, etc. cetera. Um, they found me and they asked me to do it and they'd seen what I'd done. So yeah, it's up here and I'm really proud of it. And it's published in Chinese and all sorts of things. So you asked me and I've not made any money on it. Like your book, it doesn't make money. Anyone thinks a book makes money. But it opens well it's it. funny you should say that because i'm doing an interview on friday and um, the lady has asked me to um send a link about my book because she's going to publish it and i couldn't believe it i went onto amazon last week it was 12 quid this week it's 25 pounds i can't believe it i wow. mean brilliant as it is who the hell's going to pay 25 pounds for my book well amazon so, uh, well, Amazon dodges around with the pricing, doesn't it? Well, exactly. So may maybe it's had quite a few sales and they've shoved the price up. I don't know. Yeah. So would you like to open up, Derek? Would you like, uh, we said to do about 15 minutes. We've done about 15 minutes. Would you like to open up? Somebody must have a question for him. Come on, yeah. everybody. Oh, you want me to unmute? Okay, I'll unmute. Yeah. Well, there, are, there, there is a couple of questions in the, um, in the chat box, Will. I could cover those off first. Uh, well, no. Answer Anthony's question because he's put his hand up. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Tony. Um, how many hours a day do you spend doing what you're doing at the moment with these Zoom calls, these chats? It must take a hell of a lot of your time and the second thing, can you actually then contrast that to how many days you spent doing this sort of work pre-lockdown? That's a great question, Tony. In fact, Ryan Pereira asked me on asked me about it on uh, on Monday night, and I sat down. Oh, Ryan, me. yeah, being a United you <laughs> United support, he's always about be ahead. Of I know, me. but he asked it. He asked it on WhatsApp, <laughs> and he gets embarrassed when. Yeah, but just takes, yeah, I'm just AFC Bournemouth. <laughs> yeah, well, he doesn't like all the stick that Manchester United get on WhatsApp, but we're not going there. No football, no football things. Um, I worked out it takes about fourteen to fifteen hours from. Monday morning when I have to do my briefing, set up the Zoom calls, make sure the links are right. One of the links was wrong this week, as somebody might have noticed, to advertising it, to uh, getting into Zoom, to interviewing off the record the speaker, uh, what we're going to talk about, how we're going to do it, make sure the AV works, and then to the uh, and then to it and doing it. And then I do some very short notes afterwards, which go to Keith. And luckily, Jill's been writing the notes up, so we've got a real, a real record. 14 to 15 hours beforehand and then the call. So about 18 hours, about two and a half days, probably. Uh, what was I doing before? I would have been getting my bike out, cycling, uh, taking more exercise that I hadn't been allowed to do. I would have been going to London to meet one or two people. And if I went to London to meet Will, that would probably be four hours out of my day. Whereas I'm using Zoom and I'm using Zoom much more much more effectively, which is uh, which is interesting. But um, actually, can we, can we ask everybody? So, so more point? intense now or less intense? Oh, it's just different. It's just different. I'm getting a huge buzz out of this because I'm meeting and talking to so many huge, hugely positive people and catching the energy back. And I worried where I would have got the energy from over the last ten weeks if I hadn't been doing something like this. So I'm glad I woke up on that Monday morning and just decided to go for it, which is another one of my tips for everybody. You know, if you think of something, write it down, think it, ink it, and then look at it. And if you think it's going to work or it might, might work, then just do it. Just go for it. Thank you, Derek. And thank you, Will. Uh, Kevin, you need yeah. to... <clears throat> Derek, uh, these may be interrelated questions there's two of them the first one as you said the new normal is going to be very very different can you sketch that out for us and the second one is uh as much as we appreciate what you have done for us this lockdown how can you monetize what you're doing with us okay the first question is the new normal is going to be very very different because in the uk I don't know how we're going to get to London, okay? Because if you go to London from Guildford or Woking, where I were, which are my two stations, you're generally going to stand up absolutely crushed. Um, I've seen yesterday some pictures of how they see the trains. They're going to put plastic barriers up between everybody, so you sit in a little cubicle. 
but it means about 25 percent of people will be able to get to london remember uh I don't know, 5 million people commute into London a day and 11 million people live in London. It's, it's massive. And all the infrastructure, Kevin, is um, 19th century infrastructure as well. It was leading edge technology then, but it's now, uh, now it, it works, but it's not very effective or, or, or very efficient. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of Zoom calls. Uh, I think the speaking association, our speaking association is going to put its uh, conference online this um, this year, that's what it looks like now. Almost made the decision. Don't know how they're going to earn any money out of that, whether people are going to pay for it online. And so we're going to have lots and lots more calls. I've got a call with an entrepreneur tomorrow afternoon. Um, I met him before. He's a fabulous entrepreneur. And uh, we're going to have a Zoom call. Three o'clock, mm. off an hour. You know, I'll be back in the garden. It's, so I think the new normal is going to really incorporate this technology. But I still think we've got to go and meet people. But I'm, I don't quite sure how how we're going to meet them. I don't know how to monetize this, but I would like some ideas. We have 26 videos on YouTube, whether I should um, give people a steer and give people coaching so they could go to different, uh, different uh, YouTube clips, podcasts, my book, etc. whether they'll pay for that or not. Kevin, people will pay for things a lot easier in the US than they will in the UK. People have been mm -hmm. spoon fed personal development in the UK. I struggle to get people I'm coaching to even come on here and watch it. I don't know why. And yeah, I really bully them a bit, but uh, so um, lifelong, there's not so many lifelong learners in the UK. They, they're in for a shock when um, they're in for a shock in the next two or three weeks when a lot of people get made redundant and they'll be asked the question, what did you do in those 10 weeks? And the answer is of course, nothing. So all ideas on how it might be monetized, but easily, I'm not one for spending lots of time trying to monetize things that might not work. Thank you. I, I, uh, I thought I had a real winner a couple of weeks ago. I decided to run a free um, mini workshop, if you like, um, entitled Network Your Way Into a Job. Now, <coughs> yes, now. And we know there's going to be millions of people out of work and even people who are being furloughed, who are in work at the moment, a massive percentage of them must be thinking, I am at risk. And you know what? I advertised it four times on LinkedIn and I got 10 people sign up and five of them turned up on the day. And sure. I just, I was disappointed. I mean, I did my best. Even if there'd been one on there, I still would have done my best. But I thought, I wonder why. People perhaps very comfortable at the moment and they're just not ready. And when things really get tough, maybe people will want to learn to negotiate better or learn to network better or whatever. Maybe they're just not ready for all this and they haven't faced reality. I wonder yeah, if uh, people are, are get, get, I wonder if fear gets involved or anticipatory, we call it uh, anticipatory grief. Uh, they're they're worried about what's going to come. I've noticed that I'm starting to get paid speaking engagements online, and I'm noticing I'm getting more anxious about it. If it's free, it's fine. <laughs> I'm I'm good. If it's talking to you guys, it's fine. Now all of a sudden, I've got clients who used to see me in person who are now going to see me this way, and I'm saying to myself, "Wow, now now what do I need?" And how am I going to keep them engaged? And so I'm noticing some anxiety about paid speaking engagements that are coming, whereas I'm fine with all of you. I get to wear my favorite T-shirt, and Jill loves this color, and so that's fine. And uh, I can use my virtual background. My wife hates this background. So, you know, all that stuff. But, but uh, I'm noticing a little concern about it. Now, I, I think because of Derek and all of you, I jump into opportunities that are what you would give Will. So, but I think some people are maybe anxious and afraid, and so they stay away. That's what I'm saying. Right. Can I just interject there? And this is this is not me. This came from Justin Urquhart Stewart this morning. Digital commerce. I just put it online here. A modern agile commerce platform built to handle every customer and market demand. The only solution that supports multiple marketplaces. And that's under the heading digital commerce. 
Yes. I may be telling grandmother how to suck eggs, but it's just a, a thing that I found. I think the technology is moving really, really quickly here. And uh, yeah, uh, there's a question in the chat box. Can I answer this very quickly, Will? You're in uh, charge now. I'm passing back to you. Okay, now. Ryan says, I always remember the white shirt tip, which my mum online would fully agree with. However, her conflicting things about red ties. I was once told a red tie sells, but recently I read that a red tie is aggressive. Uh, well, a red tie does give you energy. It is aggressive. Red is a is is a, is an energy color which i've toned it down with a bit of white because i used to have a red one uh, i take a blue tie with me sometimes when i'm teaching negotiations i switch it in the coffee break to see who's noticed so i can have this discussion and uh, some people pick it up straight away higher sensory acuity and awareness and some people don't even know what the person's talking about. I said, you changed your tie. I said, no, I haven't. What are you talking about? Etc. cetera. Um, red, I'm comfortable with red, red rhyme because I've always worn it and it gives me energy. And I'm anxious like Kevin and like Will and any professional speaker before you go on, I'm anxious to do a good job for the people that I'm privileged to have turned up to listen or to hear me. So I am up for it and I want to be up for it with my, maximum energy and it works for me if i wear a blue tie do you know i don't feel so comfortable and i said to sally my wife i was going to do something where everyone's going to be dressed casual and i said do you think i should dress casual and she said no you shouldn't certainly shouldn't you should dress as you normally do to give your 100 percent performance and if you do dress casual my advice would be take a branded jumper with you or a branded shirt which looks three times more expensive than the Marks and Sparks one, so that people think you're still expensive. People will disagree with me on this, but, uh, but uh, you know, that's my view. And have a think about your own brand and how you do it. So, uh, what's, a, what's a jumper, Derek? Uh, uh, pullover, pullover, jumper. Oh, uh, like a sweater, sweater or a sweater, yeah. Sweater. Okay. Kevin, um, Kevin, I noticed the light you've got. A a wonderful load of light coming in on one side. I know. Uh, I think if you are going to start doing paid work, you may want to consider finding a different place to sit. I don't, can you, is that possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I usually do it upstairs, but my wife is asleep and the servants are gone. So I am down in the <laughs> servants' quarters. So uh, <laughs> we get light coming. But yeah, I would not present here. Thank you for mentioning that though. I, I'm playing around with technology as, as everybody, I guess, is what, what should we do and how do we, what kind of technology do we need? It's really, uh, it's a different I have, world. I was speaking to a lady the other day and I said to her, are you standing up? She said, yes. I said, how did that work? She said, I bought myself a table that goes up like this. I said, well, that's yeah. interesting. How much did that cost? She said, oh, about 300 pound. I went, mm -hmm. anyway, I've just bought, <laughs> I've just bought for about 30 pound off Amazon or eBay or somewhere, uh, something that uh, a, a computer, a laptop uh, desk that you simply put on oh. your table. And so you can just raise it up to whatever you want. Because if I'm going to start doing talks, I really do want to stand up. And I do think it brings the energy if you mm -hmm. stand up. So, I can put the laptop on this new table, which should arrive today or tomorrow, and you can have it at any height, and it just then folds away and put it in the corner when you finish with it. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. Um, I was going to. Um, I just. I, I want to get back to Derek, but I do want to make all of you aware of something that's happening now, and that is not all of you are speakers. I understand that but all of us are now presenters and e-speakers, which is a, a group of people that uh, run the speaking website for us. E is in electronic speakers now offer a certification called certified virtual presenter. And it costs $49. So I don't know how much that would be in pounds but you get to put that on your website that you are a certified virtual presenter. I initially rebuffed the idea, but I have subsequently found out that 
meeting planners and other individuals that are looking to have meetings with you are very impressed with this certified virtual presenter. Kevin, you're aware of it, right? Yeah, I am. And, and if you're a member, I think they're not even charging you $49 for it. Uh, some people, have, I think um, Swernigan did it the other day. And I think they actually watch you do something. You have to kind of do a little clinic. Oh, you, so. Yeah, and, the, and they'll tell you your lighting's bad, your, your microphone is bad, your background's bad. Yeah, yeah. They will fail you, um, yeah. but they'll tell you what you have to do in order to get it right. I yeah. just a fairly good investment to put that credential out there. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Um, I mean, one of the questions I always ask, I got this from Alan Wise, is who, who certifies the certifiers? Who motivates the motivators? Who inspires the inspires? Who yeah. leads the leaders? Because that's the question we need to ask quite often, don't we? Um, uh, guys, I've just, put in, um, I've just put in the box down the bottom Jill's notes from last week, because tomorrow um, we're going to expand on some of those notes for the people that come on. So if you want to have a look at those, you can, and uh, they're quite, and, and then think about any questions you might want to ask, because we haven't got any questions in the chat box. I understand that. One of the questions you can ask yourself, and this comes from uh, neurolinguistics, and Gabby can expand on that more. When you say, have you got any questions, and people say no, you then can ask them, well, if you did have a question, what would it be? Or if they say, you know, and um, well, I can't do that yet. And you might say, well, if you could do it now, what action would you take? And that's one of those mind bending questions, which I, which I love. And of course, if you're one to one coaching someone, they often, often can't handle it. And I just say to them, go away and um, go away and have a think about it and come back to me later. Cause I like to, uh, their brains. Kevin. So, so Derek, if you could monetize this, what do you think would be your... <laughs> well, Kevin, what do you think would be some of your Kevin, first... that's such a good question. I need to cool down a bit, really. What do you think would be some of your first steps in... <laughs> if you thought to yourself, as Sally said to you, you know, we got to make some money off of this thing. You, you're very successful with all of these people, your buddies, but how can we convince somebody to pay? What, what might be some of your first first steps that might get you in the right direction or what would be some steps that you know would lead you down the path of I think I'd have to write a program uh, some, some I'd have to put this into some sort of workbook sort of style program uh, with some coaching questions and then point people in direction I'd want to feel comfortable with what I was selling and then then I thought you, I could probably set something on, up on Eventbrite and then market it in my newsletter which said um, I don't know, 50 pounds a month coaching program, mentor you um, and see what happens. I have tried that sort of thing before with no success. So I guess, um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'll, I'll have a think about it and uh, look forward to any other ideas uh, from we've people. Got a, we've got a speaker in the US, Michelle Villa, Villa Lobos, mm -hmm. who says, sell it, then write it. So um, she's suggesting that, that you start spreading the word out. And when people say, gee, that sounds great, she said, then you can always write it later. But she suggests not, not starting out with the writing, but to do that. I'm doing a program for students this summer that a uh, student and I developed very quickly, but we sold, uh, we accidentally, we sold it first. And then we wrote it. Then I got the approval to do it from my dean. So we did things in reverse and it was, uh, more successful than I thought it was going to be. And um, I, I liked her approach of, because I think many of us are kind of logical. We want to get everything in order and get, get our ducks in an order. And, and then as if we were at a store and we were showing someone our product, when in fact, I wonder if we, maybe part of the new normal is to listen to uh, uh, clients, maybe even get them involved. One of my students helped me write the program. So, and then she was my best advocate to sell it. So she's my teaching assistant, but that's another, not, uh, flipping it is another way of thinking about it. Mm, that's very interesting. I was just thinking, I, I hadn't really done what uh, Will had told me to do, and I think you had it, which was contact some of my existing clients and offer them something, but I've, I've done that this morning to my pal in Bulgaria. And I said, mm -hmm. why don't I run three, uh, three online sessions for you? Uh, 
on negotiating. I won't charge yeah. you for it because you're a pal and we'll, I'll come out to Bulgaria when this is all over. And uh, you bit my arm off for that. And so uh, I need to get back to some of the, uh, some of my other clients. But I haven't done that quick enough. Like most things, you don't always do the things that don't really hit your hotspots. I'm going to be on a call this morning with a fella and his wife. Um, and they're going to, I know what questions they're going to ask me. They told me the questions. And uh, what they're going to do is uh, we're going to do a business assessment. I know they're going to sell me their coaching program. I know that's going to happen. Uh, but I also know that I'm going to go through this diagnostic first, which may help me figure out, I've already started to do some of it on my own, help me figure out where do I want to devote my energy. And um, I did this with a client the other day, and uh, he, he was very interested in this no charge initial assessment of your business. And um, it worked very well. Uh, and I think I was very helpful to him. It, it felt less salesy and more consulting uh, from the standpoint of taking someone from here uh, to here. So that's another idea that we might use too, is some way to kind of help walk somebody through the need for what they might, might not know about. It's sort of a hidden part of yourself that, that can come forward. It's similar to the Nito experience Derek and I had of, we went and we discovered things we didn't even know we didn't know Yeah, about ourselves even. huh? Yeah. There's two things there. That's un unconscious incompetence, isn't it? And uh, it's also in the model in Yahari's window that says you don't know what you don't know. Um, and of course, both in what Will and I sell, which, um, which is pretty niche, people don't really know they haven't got negotiation skills so we point a few things out and people think oh well, network anyone can talk to anyone and yet uh, we know that 98 percent of people hate it so yeah it is marketing but i've never been one to uh, will spends a bit more money on marketing than i do i've never been one to spend money on marketing but i've been learning like mad about uh, social media and um I'm going to ask some of you guys that have been on here to start retweeting a few things in YouTube's as well, just to just to see what happens. Will you wanted to say something? Yeah, you made you made a comment a few minutes ago uh, after Kevin or Tim said something. Well, I've been a bit slow off the mark. My view is that the whole a business has been in such a shock that I think now is the time to start doing things as things settle down. People are beginning to realize this is how things are going to be in, on the communication channels. And until now, people have just, all they've worried about is how can we make sure our business survives? They're not interested in the slightest with you and me, uh, Derek, at the moment, whether we're charging or not, all they're focusing on is how can we make sure that we can get through to Christmas and then hopefully after that thing then do start to settle down. Mm. And that's why I've not been pushing. I mean, I've got a fabulous online learning program, which is perfect, but even are people going to even pay for that yet? I don't know. Mm. Uh, so that's my thinking um, that people are, uh, are now beginning to get used to what's going on and maybe just maybe they might start spending money. You mentioned the fear factor. I think Kevin mentioned the fear factor. It's interesting that uh, there's a guy I've been mentoring from uh, a charity that uh, I do some work for, and I'm, I'm obviously not charging him. Um, and, but I haven't been able to get him to watch more than two or three of these programs. Suddenly he wants to speak to me because there's a, he's, he's twigged there's going to be some redundancies there in the last week or you know, in the next week or two. So I'm speaking to him at uh, four o'clock this afternoon and I remember wow. in Barclays again and this goes back to what Will teaches all the time people used to bombard me with CVs can you help me Derek I hadn't heard from them for five years suddenly they had a problem and they expected me to jump around and uh, help them with their CVs and my first reaction was I haven't heard from you pal for five years you know you need to stay in touch with people what's your expression you need to touch start touch with people constantly if you then want their help, because I think it's Giordini said that reciprocity is not a one-way street. Reciprocity 
is a two-way street. Mm -hmm. If you put stuff out, if you don't yeah. start getting stuff back after two or three times, you kind of write people off. When I do coaching with people, I, um, <clears throat> I give them the homework and the homework is to write me an email about what they learned from our interaction during this hour of coaching. And uh, I said, I want you to do it within the first 48 hours, if possible, so that I'm, so that I remember what I want to then tell you. And as soon as I get your e email, I will write you an email back about what I learned. And that becomes the record of essentially our, our hour together. And it's interesting, some of them write me three bullet points. One guy wrote me about a thousand words the other day, but it never really would occur to me what that he had learned what he learned on the call. And so it was very, very helpful to kind of get an insight into, into him. And um, when, when I'm advising them, I advise doctors on how to get their resumes in, in order for executive positions. And it's interesting because I will, they'll say, well, it doesn't look very good. I said, write it in any form you want. We can always wordsmith it later. The idea is what makes you so different? What's, what's really good about you that we want to create a narrative? And I think a lot of people don't think that way. I think they think of, I'm going to write down everything I've ever done. And I said, that's not what an interviewer is looking for. They're not looking for your experience. They're looking for your capability. What is it you can do for me? I think uh, Nito, Derek said, uh, can you help me solve my problem? That's the that's what's in the audience's mind. It's what's in our 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 um, client's mind. And I, you know, it's not easy. But if we could figure out uh, what the answer to that is, that's the thing that people would pay for. I think. Um, and I told you all, I'm I'm conducting an experiment this summer with my students. They want to know how much they should pay me for this summer seminar I'm doing. And I said, just pay me at the end of 12 weeks what you think it was worth to you. Well, that is making them insane. They, oh, well, what, what is, how much is too much? How much isn't enough? Mm -hmm. What, it's really funny to hear them struggle. That's the main struggle they have. They talk to each other about it. They talk to my TA about it, the teaching assistant. And uh, she said, so what do you think? I said, I think they should just pay me what they think it's worth. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. I'm not weeks. sure that will work, but I might try that as well. I think we'll, maybe we'll, <laughs> Will, Graham and I are talking about doing a little thing. Maybe we should try that on that one. And, uh... or, or even, even as a good tester, pay me what you think it's worth and all the money will go to the, a charity. I'm oh, not, that's just, do you think that charity thing works though, Will? I'm not sure. Well, ex what it does, it, I'm just thinking aloud, it gives you an indication of how would they have paid us the same money that they would give to charity? I don't know. It's a measure. I, you don't think so? I don't know. What do you, what do what would you give Derek if he said uh, after twenty seven uh, YouTubes that all of you have participated in? Uh, what if we were to write him a check? Uh, Kevin, I think I think it's time that we all uh, left the meeting at this point. <laughs> I'd just say, as you say to Derek, just take it up. I'd say to Derek, just take it off what you owe me. <laughs> Martin, are you nothing? You've plagiarised my material for forty years. Can I just uh, make one comment on sort of um, observation? Yeah. Um, I can remember going back to I think it was probably the late eighties, before the days of the internet, but when computer training, learning, development, people were writing software for it. And the uh, doomsayers were, uh, were um, predicting the end of uh, what I would loosely call classroom training or learning and development, face-to-face -face training. And of course, it didn't happen. Uh, now, it, it has changed very much over the years. Um, and I'm sure uh, the new normal will not include that for some considerable time. But however good, this form of communication is, in my humble view, it does not beat meeting people, talking to them, being in a room, having that experience, uh, exchanging your experience with other people, learning together, uh, being allowed to do sort of practical simulations of what it is you're trying to learn. Uh, so I think there will come a day when that will, because human nature being what it is, that will work its way back in in some way. Uh, there are lots of advantages to what we're doing now, but there are also lots of disadvantages, like getting, getting to say something, for instance. 
Yeah. I'm going to I'm going to cut the recording off now, guys, because it's been going on for 50 minutes. But let's stay on the line and carry on, carry on with this chat. It's uh, it's very good. So just to close it, uh, uh, thanks, Will, for uh, interviewing me and asking me some difficult questions. If you like this recording on YouTube, please like it and comment on it because that helps all of us. So thanks for joining us and look forward to seeing you on the next one.